America's southern borders are overwhelmed as of late, but that may just be the beginning. Do you think that you'll get in? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. We go to the choke point for hundreds of thousands of immigrants, the dangerous narrow crossing called the Darien Gap in Panama, to see what's driving the rush for the American border. We ask this woman if she thinks it'll be easier to enter the U.S. under President Biden. Part of Russian President Putin's precept to war was a threat of Nazis in Ukraine. Are there Nazis or Nazi followers in Ukraine? Yes. Extremism is blooming when there are crises, as they are now. We're in Germany to investigate the deep roots between nationalism and Nazism and why it matters. If I understand correctly, a majority of Hispanic voters still vote Democrat or support Democrats. But the big news is how many more of them have gone to the Republican side than previously. Hispanics really understand how bad big government is. And we take a look at what's being called the big shift, the swing of the Hispanic voter, and just what that means. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. We begin with our reporting about illegal border crossings, which continue to shatter all records. Dozens of Texas counties have proposed or passed resolutions calling the border crisis an invasion, in part to pressure the federal government to secure the border. Last week, President Biden visited the border, the first time in his two years as president, and offered to expand the use of Trump-era border control measures. As millions are drawn to the U.S. southern border, many make a dangerous journey from South America through a notorious stretch of mountainous jungle called the Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama. That's the site of our cover story this week with Scott Thuman, measuring the effect of President Biden's border policies. As the sun rises over southern Panama, we travel through one remote village after another. There is little to note along this dusty stretch five hours from the country's capital, but where we're going, the headlines are countless because the people passing through are two. Just after crossing into the notorious Darien province near the border with Colombia, we are stopped at a series of military checkpoints that the Panamanians don't want us to video for security reasons. Eventually, as we move on a hillside near the town of Metedi, we reach this compound, a makeshift camp run in part by nonprofits and the Panamanian authorities. This is a critical point at the end of a long winding river that is now a key migration route for tens of thousands who cross on their way to enter the U.S. We meet Augustin. He is 28 from the African nation of Cameroon. And like a majority of those here, he tells us of a frightening trek along one of the most dangerous migrant routes in the world called the Darien Gap. How was it going through the jungle? It's terrible. Like, I cannot say someone to use the jungle because it's very, very terrible. Like, you see people are dying, like people are crying, injured, so it's not really nice. I cannot advise someone to use the jungle because it's terrible. You tell people don't go, it's too no, terrible. It's too terrible. For real, like, it's too terrible. Like the mountain, like water, like it's too terrible. It is 60 miles of thick, muddy jungle, steep hills, and treacherous swamps. the only overland path connecting South to Central America. And as documented in these videos, the terrain can break, if not kill, even the strongest of travelers. That is aside from the poisonous snakes and spiders. Many run out of food and clean water quickly. And then there is the violence inflicted by the cartels that lord over this jungle and reports of rapes and robberies by armed local gangs and native tribes. Jessica from Ecuador came through with her 11-month and 6-year-old boys. The crossing was very difficult. 
with lots of swamps. Your feet sink in the ground. We had to climb many rocks, sometimes like this, sometimes in the sun. I asked if she saw people sick or dying. Yes, in our path there was a person that had died. I don't know the cause, but they died. Another lady died too because the rocks fall off. She fell from a tall height and died. The gap is a moneymaker for coyotes, locals from the Colombian side who charge from $50 to $300 to lead the way. One of the tricks they use is to offer shorter or longer treks depending on how much people can pay. The longest routes can take a week, the shortest about three days. Those who emerge then spend another $25 to take one of these boats up the river to the camp. Two hours by boat. And how many people can you put in one boat? What nationalities? I ask what nationalities he's seen most. He says Venezuelans, Cubans, Ecuadorians, and Peruvians. Last year, more than 240,000 were known to have crossed the gap, a tenfold increase from 2019 when 24,000 came through. Some governments are documenting whoever they can, using biometric tools like fingerprints and photos to track their movement. Diana Romero is a Panama-based crisis coordinator for UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund. The increasing number of children in the Darien corresponds to the fact that whole families are migrating, not just adults as was customary before, when parents would go ahead and start wiring money back to bring their relatives. Now the problems in the countries they come from are making whole families migrate, and the most worrying thing we see is the increasing number of children. This man from Haiti told us how sick his 16-month-old baby got after drinking bad water during their six days in the jungle. Walking through this encampment, this sort of makeshift marketplace, you're absolutely struck by how many voices, how many languages you're hearing. At least 70 nationalities were recorded in 2022. While they come from all over, including from some nations hostile to the U.S. Their goal is a common one, to make it to the United States. Where do you want to go eventually? I want to the United States. Do you think that you'll get in? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Why do you say of course? I just know they are welcoming and they don't, want, they don't need someone that likes trouble and I believe I'm not a troublemaker, so I, I believe we, we, um, they, will, they will receive me. This is very fast. They claim, despite long dreaming of life in the U.S., this is perhaps their best chance, based on a belief that under President Biden, it will happen. We ask this woman if she thinks it'll be easier to enter the U.S. under President Biden. Yes, I think so, because Trump is against immigrants. That notion that President Trump was tougher than Biden on illegal immigrants is something we hear a lot in the camp. And in Washington, record crossings have become a hallmark of the Biden administration. Last month, the head of U.S. Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, met with leaders in Colombia and Ecuador to address the constant caravans through the Darien Gap. The administration claims it is trying to dissuade illegal immigrants. It clearly isn't working. After getting out of the jungle, this is where many of the migrants arrive, and it's their first point of safety, but it's hardly the end. They know they've got thousands of miles more to go in some cases and unsure how they'll get there. Buses are leaving the camp all day, every day for the 12-hour trip to the next country's border a $40 ticket to Costa Rica. Mohammed Zaman Zahil came all the way from Afghanistan with his wife, two-year-old, and three-month-old baby. Are you uh, confident that the United States will let you in? No, no. Uh, we uh, will go illegal in 
You'll go illegally if you have to. Illegal. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The allure of America, enough that neither a deadly jungle nor an uncertain future will stop this flow. We keep breaking new records with the number of illegal border crossings. Do you think we're expecting even more in 2023? Well, it's quite possible. Everyone I spoke to told me the same thing. They said that it's the conditions on the ground in their countries that are driving them to leave and show up here. So whether it be crime or poverty or war, that's the driving force. If that unrest continues elsewhere, you can expect to have more immigrants show up here. And as for the Darien Gap, we keep hearing how dangerous it is and what goes on there. Did you get the sense it is really that bad? It is considered one of the most dangerous migration routes in the world. That is correct. Uh, it's controlled by armed gangs. They determine who goes through, what contraband goes through. And really, that's what poses some of the greatest risks. That's why we chose to uh, approach it from the Panamanian side, and even then we had to have a security team with us. Sounds like nobody's really strongly policing it or able to. No, not able to. All right, thanks, Scott. Ahead on Full Measure, we head to Europe to find out, are there really Nazis in Ukraine? As the Russia-Ukraine war drags on, Russia President Putin's campaign has been built in part on the claim that he's denazifying Ukraine. It's an allegation vehemently disputed by the other side. On our search for the facts, we learned one thing for certain. Today there are Nazis in Ukraine. For context, we head to Germany to consult an expert on extremism in Ukraine and beyond. Allegations of a Nazi element in Ukraine and supposed evidence of their heinous acts circulate on social media. In Germany, I consulted an expert on right-wing extremism and a critic of anti-Jewish sentiment, Professor Haya Funke. Does extremism bloom when there is economic distress and a lot of chaos? Yes. Extremism is blooming when there are crises, as they are now, when there is war, as it is now. So, uh, Funke says Ukraine's Nazi history dates back before World War II to a man named Stepan Bandera, who collaborated infamously with the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis. Stepan Bandera was the leader of the most radical Ukrainian nationalist during the Second World War. And he decided, together with Nazi uh, leaders, to fight against Jews, to fight against Polish people. Bandera is said to be responsible for killing scores of Jews in Ukraine. After the war, he left Ukraine for West Germany, where documents indicate the U.S. considered him a valuable intelligence asset against a common enemy, the Soviet Union, and the spread of communism. After Russian agents reportedly assassinated Bandera in 1959, some in Ukraine elevated his memory to martyrdom, despite his Nazi ties. Those who applause uh, applaud to, to uh, this kind of uh, remembrance of uh, Bandera are still widespread in the West Ukraine. You have a lot of statues reminding, remembering uh, this person. In 2010, Ukraine's then President Viktor Yushchenko awarded Bandera the title Hero of Ukraine, a decision condemned by Russia, Jewish groups and Europe and later overturned in court. A more recent high-level Bandera admirer, Ukraine's ambassador to Germany, Andrei Melnik, removed from his post last July in a scandal after he defended Bandera's memory. So interestingly, it was Putin who said there were Nazis still in Ukraine. Was he right, though, that there are some Nazis in Ukraine? Yes, but uh, he wasn't right because he generalized it, and that was totally wrong. Can you be more specific? Like, he, he made it sound like a bigger issue than it is? Yes, of course. It's totally wrong to say the, the Ukrainian society and the, the polity of the Ukraine uh, uh, is Nazistic. That's f full-scale wrong. 
that doesn't mean that they are nationalist, uh, even as extreme as Putin himself is, also in the Ukraine, but they are not dominant. Also in Berlin, I spoke with Dahlia Greenfeld of the pro-Jewish Anti-Defamation League. Are there Nazis or Nazi followers in Ukraine? In Ukraine, like in any other part of the world, in Russia, in Germany or the US, there are extremists and also neo-Nazis. But the important fact is that it's a marginal, small group that only got just over 2% in the 2019 elections and they don't have any political power, they don't have any influence, they're not a big group. She says today Nazis have blended with a nationalist movement in Ukraine to fight Russia in the war, making for a complex formula. She insists that Nazi imagery, like an apparent swastika on a bracelet worn by Ukraine's armed forces commander-in-chief, symbolizes nationalism. We've seen pictures on social media that appear to be groups of Ukrainians with a flag that would represent Nazi support, and they look like they're all on board with that. <laughs> In fact, yes, in Kiev in 2022, we, we saw in the marches, we saw black and red flags symbolizing the World War II um, forces that worked with, with the Germans. Why? Because it's a, a symbol of independence for them. In Ukrainians' mind, this is not a symbol of Nazism. However, for Ukrainian Jews, this is a no-go. Ukrainian Jewish communities and individuals have spoken out very loudly that this is not a symbol to use. Even the Jewish community recognized that there is Russian propaganda about Nazis in Ukraine and the Ukrainian Jewish communities in the different cities. So for them, they align mostly with the general population of fighting for their country and they don't see the few extremists, the few neo-Nazis as a threat to their democracy. A recent foreign policy analysis predicts an uptick this year in state-sponsored terrorism from Russia-aligned groups to neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Coming up next, a big shift in a key voting trend. For a long time, it was considered a given that nearly all Hispanics would put their support behind Democrats. But in the midterm elections, a growing number of Hispanic American voters backed Republican candidates. Experts say a big shift is underway. Americano Media conducted a recent poll on the subject. Yvonne Garcia Hidalgo is its founder and CEO of the group. If you could pick just one or two of the biggest takeaways, what would you say those are? I would say Donald Trump moved the Hispanic vote by almost 20 percent, from uh, Obama's 71 percent to Joe Biden right now ranking at 54. I think that's historic. That's massive. That is uh, that that is an incredible, uh, incredible uh, you know accomplishment. Hispanics really understand, you know, how bad big government is, how bad socialism is. We've seen it all over Latin America for decades and destroy every single bo booming economy like it's doing right now. All over Latin America, it's collapsed to the left, to Marxist, to openly communist people. Democrats can still count on getting most of the Hispanic vote. But the news is how much the margin has narrowed. From the 2018 congressional midterms to 2022, Democrats went from a 40-point advantage over Republicans to just 14 points. In the 2020 presidential election, Joe Biden led Donald Trump among Hispanics 65 percent to 33 percent. But in a hypothetical 2024 matchup, Biden's margin is half of his 2020 margin over Trump. If I understand correctly, a majority of Hispanic voters still vote Democrat or support Democrats. But the big news is how many more of them have gone to the Republican side than previously. That's correct. And also the shift. So the biggest loser here in this poll is the Democratic Party. Hispanics have moved away from Democrats. Some have gone Republican, but 29 percent identify as independent. And that's that's a big number. That's really where your swing voter is. And right now, when you look at that independent group, that 29 percent, they say, according to the poll, that they're going to vote for the for the issues that benefit the Republican Party. So you're going to see this big shift. Did your poll show that Hispanic voters are very much concerned about similar things as non-Hispanic voters or 
or do they set themselves apart in their interests and the issues that matter the most? Well, actually, you know, the, 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 they're exactly like every regular American. They're just in jobs, the economy, security and education, crime, all, all these things. Immigration is really not ranked in the top five even. So Democrats like to create and grab wedge issues and try and divide people. And that's what they've been doing with Hispanics. You hear Spanish language television today, and there's absolutely no control. They sit there and they scream and yell, Trump is a rapist, he's a criminal, he's a, he's a killer. And you're like, where do they come up with this stuff? There's no evidence they even say that, but they get away with it and say it every day. What other data points were really standouts in the poll that you did? One of them, 71% of Hispanics agree the, com the country is going in the wrong direction. That is, you know, nobody can deny that. I think Hispanics really get that. I don't know where the other 29% are getting information, um, but who knows? You know, must be Univision, Telemundo, or CNN, you know, to, to get that. Looking ahead at the 2024 election, what do you foresee in terms of Hispanic vote influence? I think it's going to be huge. All Hispanics that have left all of Latin America because of these policies, because they've destroyed them, their families, their businesses, their countries, come here and see the same rhetoric coming out of the Democratic Party. And they're going to say, no way, never again. We've lost our country. We're not going to lose this one. There is nowhere else to go. There is nowhere else to go. If the United States collapses, is destroyed by the left, where are we going to go? There's nowhere else to go. So Hispanics are going to play a very, very important role in the future of the United States of America. Analysts say the Hispanic vote was key in midterm races in Florida, Illinois, California, and Nevada. We'll be right back. Updating some of our winter energy forecasting, winter hit right on time and hard, leaving millions of Americans to face the coldest Christmas in decades. Just before that storm, we raised the question of whether the energy grid could withstand a sustained winter assault. If we get into a, a real cold snap, we could face issues. What would that look like if that happened this winter? We would have to be prepared for the potential of rolling blackouts. So how did the country hold up? People across eight states from Texas to Virginia were forced to cope with rolling blackouts due to a spike in demand for natural gas. There were threats of rolling blackouts in nine other states and Washington, D.C. In New England, some power providers were forced to tap into strategic reserves of fuel oil to generate enough electricity to meet demand. More winter ahead and concern for how much longer that strategic supply could last. Coming up next week on Full Measure, controversy over solar farms replacing America's food farms. So literally 15-foot solar panels behind an 8-foot fence 150 feet from my house. Are we risking a food shortage in the rush to fuel the green energy push? Both sides next week on Full Measure. Until then, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching, and I'm Cheryl Axon.